I'm excited to be here today with my colleagues from Americans for Prosperity to talk about criminal justice reform. One of my favorite, really my favorite issue to talk about. Um, I'm gonna let these experts who you're gonna see talk more deeply about all the different issues we wanna make sure we talk about today and in the future, because we've got some great ideas and I know you all have great ideas and this is all part of what we talk about all the time that you know, unite with anyone to do good and with no one to do harm. And you know, from my perspective, real quick, um, I grew up in Worcester, Massachusetts. And when I was in high school, I got in trouble. Uh, but instead of going to prison, I got a job at the local prison. And it was really eye-opening for me back then. And this was in the early 1980s. And I worked there to pay for college. And what I learned there was when I was young that, man, I'm very lucky that I wasn't in there. And looking back on how bad the system was back then, if you as old as I am now, and you look at what happened with the war on drugs and the tough on crime era and all these other things, it's what all the politicians both sides did to you know, make the system worse or more tough and just try to win elections. Um, if you told Mark Holden in 1981 that, you know, fast forward to today, um, that the one issue that seems to unite everybody, and I mean everybody, left, right, center, in between, you name it, at the, at the local level and at, at, at the state level and at the federal level as well, the one thing that everybody unites around is criminal justice reform. And that's very exciting. And I'd like to see more of that happen in other areas, but we'll, we'll, we'll go for this for sure. And you know what, what we've learned over the years is with working with people like you all here at the staffers and others, but what I've learned working with our people in, um, who work in the States and um, for Americans for Prosperity, that's where it all started. We know this right in 2007. And our team has been a part of it from the beginning pretty much. And we're very excited to keep doing it. Uh, because we think that we can bring a lot to it. And we've worked again with the, it goes back to the Frederick Douglass quote that we work with anyone to do good and no one to do harm. And we've worked with people on the left, people on the right, people in between, you name it. Our first, you know, when we started looking at these issues a long time ago, we started basically with um, what's in the code because you need to know what the laws are. And that just kind of, you know, we, we saw that and we saw problems there and we just kept going and going and going. And our teams have been really um, the last five, 10 years growing more and more in the states and at the federal level. We've got a great team and, and a lot of groups have great teams. So there's a lot more we can do here. And so today, you know, we just want to talk about what reforms we think can happen uh, this year and in the next, ne next few years, quite frankly, state level, but definitely at the federal level. And we know there's a lot of people out here with some great ideas. I think our team's got some great ideas. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, what we're talking about is making the system better. And we know just you know, working, for example, with the, the um, First Step Act, that was something that I worked on when it started in 2014 with Mike Lee and others. And that takes a long time to get these issues done. But we know more and more that when we get these issues done, it makes things better for everybody. It's about connecting people and making communities safer. And so, I'm very excited to be here today, and I'm going to now introduce our panel, who are experts in these areas much more than I am. Um, first, we have Jeremiah Mosteller, the senior policy uh, analyst for CJR and AFP at AFP. Greg Glad, policy fellow at um, AFP. Uh, Melinda Garcia and Michael Dingle, who are um, government affairs at AFP. And they're gonna take it from here. And I thank you all for being a part of this. And hopefully we can all work together to make our system better. And one of the things I'll end here is that one of my favorite quotes, and this is about, all about second chances in a lot of ways, um, is that man should never place a period where God has intended a comma. And that's what we've seen with the First Step Act and other act when we start to look at data and science, and that's what we need to keep doing. So anyway, thank you all, take care, and enjoy the, the event today. Thank you so much, Mark, and thank you everybody who has joined. As he mentioned, I'm Mary Linda Garcia with the Government Affairs Team at Americans for Prosperity, and I'm gonna chat for a minute with Jeremiah Mosteller. He is our senior policy analyst. Before that, however, just a quick reminder, if you have any questions 
during this entire briefing, um, please at any point pop them into the chat function and then we'll get to them at the question and answer portion at the end. So um, Jeremiah, let's hop to it. In criminal justice reform and other issues for a number of reasons, there tends to be a media focus on the big ticket, more comprehensive packages. So for example, with First Step, that was a priority with the administration. There was even celebrity involvement with, of all unlikely people, Kim Kardashian. Um, then last summer, we had a catalyst societal event with the untimely death of George Floyd. And there was a lot of attention on that subsequent legislation. However, even in the absence of those things, there's a lot of good and meaningful legislation that's in circulation in Congress right now that doesn't get a lot of attention at any point. And some of that is rather small in scale per se or standalone, but these reforms are extremely effective and timely. So could you talk to us about four of those pieces of legislation that AFP is supporting, you know, advocating for in various ways and that we wanna to highlight today. Could you tell us what those are and why they're important? Thanks, Melinda, and thanks for having me come to talk with you guys today. Agreed, there are so many things we could talk about, but really I think there's four bills that are truly transformative, but also have a high likelihood of passing in the 117th Congress. So I'll just kind of briefly hit those and, and what they are. So first, uh, because it's made it the most progress so far, is the Effective Assistance of Counsel in the Digital Era Act. Uh, in a nutshell, the Sixth Amendment provides every American with a guarantee to the assistance of counsel when they're involved in the criminal justice system. And one key component of that is what most people on this call today have probably heard uh, attorney-client privilege. So the protection of those conversations between an attorney and their client. So under federal law currently, any communications between an individual who's incarcerated and their attorney are protected if those communications are in person, are through the mail or over the phone. This bill will just simply update federal law to reflect the fact that email is a vital means of communication and that it should receive the same protections as those other forms of communications. I think the second bill that is already receiving a lot of attention and is, we're really excited about is the Prohibiting Punishment of Acquitted Conduct Act. Uh, federal law currently allows judges to sentence an individual for conduct that a jury has actually found them innocent of. Yes, found them innocent of conduct and the judge can still punish them for that conduct. That normally shocks people. Most people don't know that this exists, but it's called acquitted conduct sentencing. So this bill will essentially restore the role of the jury in our federal system and in this practice to ensure that we continue to hold to the principle that someone is innocent until they are proven guilty. Another bill, a little different than the first two, but is the Driving for Opportunity Act. Many states currently suspend someone's driver's license simply because they are unable to pay a debt. These suspensions are not because of a public safety risk or because they were a reckless driver. Um, to kind of put this in perspective, many of us in DC, if, at least before COVID, if we wanted to get somewhere, we could jump on Metro and we could get there pretty easily, uh, whether through Metro or on buses. But most people across the country, they rely solely on a personal vehicle. This is the only way to get to the job, only way to take care of their family. So if we're taking away someone's ability to drive, they can actually get to their job and then pay those underlying fines and fees for which their license is suspended. So this is a very counterproductive policy that is actually working against the goal of trying to encourage people to pay off those debts. We've seen so far that cities and states that mitigate or in this practice actually see their collections go up, which seems to make sense based on the fact that this is counterproductive. Uh, the Driving for Opportunity Act would simply do really one thing. It would equip states who want to end this practice to do so and overcome the short-term budgetary impact through a grant program in the Department of Justice. And I think last but not least, I wanna talk a little bit about the Equal Act. And I wanna make sure I'm clear, I'm not talking the Equality Act, I'm talking the Equal Act. Uh, this bill would actually get rid of a disparity that currently exists in federal law between crack and powder cocaine. This is important because 
When this law was initially adopted, the disparity was 100 to 1 and has subsequently been reduced to 18 to 1. But legislators at that time really wanted to do something to respond to violence they were seeing in a lot of communities. But since that time, there has been a lot of science and research coming out showing that these two forms of the same drug are nearly chemically identical, have the same impact on an individual whenever they're using this substance and that we're not actually improving public safety or reducing drug use with this type of disparity. But there's also the flip side of this. We now know that there is a clear racial divide that exists between those convicted of crack cocaine and those convicted of powder cocaine offenses. 81% of those convicted for crack offenses are black, whereas only 27% of those convicted of powder cocaine offenses are black. The Equal Act will build upon things that have already been previously done by Congress in the Fair Sentencing Act and the First Step Act to finally get rid of this disparity that has no justification in public safety. So Melinda, I think those are kind of the four things that are getting a lot of attention that have a big chance of passing this Congress that are not part of a big package and are not one of those big things that are going to get a lot of immediate attention as the First Step Act did. Well, thanks for that, Jeremiah. And I think you raise a really good point that some of these seem like total no brainers. So it, you know, you do think, well, you know, why hasn't this happened before? And in the case of a number of these pieces of legislation, this actually isn't their first time at the rodeo, so to speak, right? So can you talk to us a little bit about where they are in the process? Have they been reintroduced? Are they coming from the House or the Senate? Are we looking for a companion bill in either? Um, so in other words, what kind of bipartisan work is needed? And then who are some of the current, uh, in our view, champions um, on these issues leading these that you know, perhaps some of the people on this call could get in touch with? So I think the exciting thing is all four of those bills have bipartisan support in Congress, as well as diverse support among external groups, our partners, as well as many of them have strong support from law enforcement groups. So it shows that, that these common sense ideas have support across the spectrum. And so to kind of think about where we are on them. So three of those bills are reintroductions from last session, the effective assistance of counsel, prohibiting uh, acquitted conduct and driving for opportunity are reintroduced this session. Equal Act is a new bill. Uh, the effective assistance of counsel and the Digital Air Act has already moved to the house. It passed with 414 votes. I would challenge most people listening today to show me another bill that has passed with that many votes so far in Congress. Uh, but now we're awaiting a hearing in the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, this is a pretty common sense reform, so I hope that Senators Durbin and Grassley will move it, move it forward pretty quickly. Uh, the prohibited punishment of acquitted conduct, um, the Equal Act, and Driving for Opportunity will have companions. If they don't, the only one that doesn't so far is Driving for Opportunity, which has only been introduced in the Senate. So all of those bills will have a Senate and a House version, and all are currently waiting for some movement in their respective judiciary committees. The only difference with one of those bills, the Equal Act, is that it was confusingly referred to the House Committee on Energy and Commerce as well. So I hope that House leadership is not trying to stop that bill from going forward by providing dual committee assignment there. So we're told that that committee has very wide jurisdiction, so we'll hope for the best <laughs> on that one. And um, some of our sponsors of that bill actually do sit on that committee, so maybe that's a good sign. Remains to be seen, but we certainly appreciate, um, again, for any of you on the call whose boss might be interested in any of these pieces of legislation, would love their support, advocacy, communication, um, et cetera. Um, anytime these can be highlighted, um, we really appreciate that. So moving to the next point, Jeremiah, could you talk about some of the advocacy that our organization is currently doing um, you know, within communities, media, with um, some congressional offices and what opportunities might be there? Yeah, so, so on this call right now, we have parts of the AFP policy and uh, government affairs teams. So we're working really hard on the policy side. But as Mark mentioned earlier, AFP is actually part of the larger stand together community, 
which is a group of organizations that are all fully bought in on solving the serious problems in our criminal justice system. And we look at this beyond policy. And the way we look at this actually helps us within our policy and government affairs work as well. So just to give some examples, uh, we have organizations as diverse as the Stand Together Foundation, which works with nonprofits helping to replicate innovative solutions to substance use and to reentry across the country. We have Stand Together Ventures that is working with businesses to help implement innovative solutions through the private sector in the criminal justice system and beyond to help the criminal justice system. We work with academics through the Charles Koch Foundation. And of course, last but not least, the American Prosperity Foundation through its Grassroots Leadership Academy is actually working to train millions of activists across the country to engage on the issues that are important, including criminal justice. And so each of those entities have different capabilities but it's really exciting that we get to work with colleagues at other business units um, who are working with those practitioners, who are working with academics and who are working with the grassroots in the states to really give us a unique way to kind of see how the policies we're working on in Congress will actually impact communities on a day to day basis. And so I think that's something we really bring to this perspective that is unique. And we have a lot of other coalition partners that we love to work with that also have some of those capabilities as well. Yeah, many of you, again, um, listening may have already had a meeting with us in conjunction with one of our partners, for example, Prison Fellowship. We've been doing quite a bit of lobbying, particularly on the Equal Act. Um, so that's been fantastic. Jeremiah, what could we ask from those participating in the call? I mean, obviously, and again, feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any questions. Um, on any of these pieces of legislation or on this general topic, criminal justice reform in general. But what are what can we ask the people listening to do if they would like to get involved or learn more, or perhaps you know this is something that might be important um, in their districts, uh, their boss's district back home? What would be a good first step to learn more? Yeah, so like you said, I would just echo, feel free to, to reach out to the AFP team. I am more than willing to nerd out with you on any policy issues that you really want to dig into. I think something else I would recommend is reach out to the sponsors of these bills. Maryland, I know you asked about champions earlier, and I, I kind of forgot that point, so I'll just make that point here. I think some champions that are we're really excited to continue to work with uh, on these bills is Senators Durbin, Grassley, Lee, Booker, Wicker, and Coons in the Senate and representatives Jeffrey, Scott, Armstrong, and Taylor in the House. So if you're interested in any of those bills, uh, feel free to reach out to the key contacts there. And if you don't know who's doing what bill, we can always help you with that as well. Um, I think beyond that, uh, I just would echo that we're willing to put our full resources behind any bills that align with our vision of improving the criminal justice system. And we're willing to start at the beginning of really trying to bring in those resources to help you figure out how to achieve the goal that you want to achieve. And we can really leverage all of those capabilities to help you think about what is the best way to get to solve this problem. So, and of course, we also have a full comms team. We have 35 state chapters and all of the partners that Maryland are referenced. So we really want to work alongside you to help find these innovative solutions and all you have to do is reach out or more than willing to help. Definitely echo that. And again, appreciate you being on. Um, for those of you that have might just joined, Mary Linda Garcia, Government Affairs, Jeremiah Mosteller, our policy team. And we just discussed four of the bills that we're currently advocating on. And now we're gonna kick it over to our colleagues, Mike Dingle from our Government Affairs team and our policy fellow, Greg Glaud, to continue the conversation on some other issues important to us. And again, just a reminder, if you have any questions at any point during this discussion, please pop them in the chat and we will be happy to get to them during our Q&A portion at the end. Thanks. Thanks, Mary Linda. Um, let's just right, jump right, right into it, Greg. Um, QI, Qualified Immunity. What is the problem with it and how would reforming it guarantee both justify protection and warranted accountability for law enforcement personnel. No, thanks, Mike, for that question. So for those that don't know, qualified immunity, you kind of have to go back a little bit. So in 1871, uh, Congress passed the Ku Klux Klan Act, and this was um, a series of reforms and policies to protect the rights of new uh, former slaves uh, that now were American citizens that were uh, to protect the uh, constitutional rights of these individuals. A part of that was 42 USC 
1983. And I'll just uh, refer to it as 1983 from here on out. And what that said was any person under the color of law, so any government employee at the state and local level who deprives someone of their constitutional rights shall be liable to the party injured in an action of law. And that is as clear as day as it says. If you deprive an American citizen of their rights, you can be held liable um, in, in a civil court for either injunctive relief or other uh, relief as deemed necessary. Uh, through the years, though, we saw this start to kind of uh, transform through uh, judicial court cases. And so really from 1871 all the way up to the 1960s, this worked. If there was a deprivation of rights, you could sue in federal court and then you could move past it with injunctive relief or any other type of relief. Right around the late 1960s, we started to see this shift in, this, in the court saying, well, if a government employee thinks that there's a, a good faith reason for what they're doing, maybe we can let this slide. Or if they had a good intention, or maybe the law was constitutional at the time and a cop arrested someone uh, for something, but later it turned out to be unconstitutional, maybe we shouldn't hold um, those officers accountable. But it all seemed well and good um, and good intention. But we slowly started to matriculate down the road. And what we have today is what you would call qualified immunity, which essentially uh, in its essence, deprives individuals who have had their uh, constitutional rights deprived from accountability from government officials. And so now we have a two-part test. And to recover uh, in an action against a, uh, a state or local employee under 1983, you have to satisfy both of these questions. Do the actions of the government official violate the Constitution? If you're able to show there's a violation of the Constitution, you go to step two. Is the violation clearly established? Now that may seem well and good. Is, is it established? Is someone put on notice? But the way that that term has been defined has really turned into some really egregious outcomes at, uh, at the district court level, the appellate court level, and now at the Supreme Court level. So I'll just give you an example of a, of a very recent case. Um, in Corbett v. Vickers, there was officers pursuing a fleeing suspect into the yard of Amy Corbett where her six children her were outside playing with their dog. A suspect fled into their yard, uh, cops surrounded the suspect, told them that everyone to get on the ground. The dog was a cute little dog, wasn't bar you know, barking a little bit, wasn't attacking anyone, wasn't doing anything. No one seems, uh, by all eyewitness accounts, no one seems you know, concerned about the dog being a threat. An officer shot it. The dog retreats back into um, uh, underneath the, uh, the deck. The dog comes back out a little bit later, terrified, scared, what's going on. The officer tries to shoot at the dog again and inadvertently hits the 10-year-old kid. The court said, yes, this was a violation of your constitutional rights, what they did. This was a violation of the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. This was an unnecessary and unconstitutional seizure. However, in this jurisdiction, we have never had a case before where we have said as the court that this is unconstitutional and you can't do it. So too bad you can't recover. Another case, Jessup v. City of Fresno, two officers um, stole $225,000 worth of cash and rare coins during a raid on certain illegal gambling machines. This is not they seized stuff illegally. They kept it for themselves. The evidence showed that they kept it for themselves. The Ninth Circuit said, hey, listen, this is obviously unconstitutional. Cops can't keep money from a search and seizure for their own personal gain. However, we've never had a case where cops have stolen stuff and, and received a personal gain. And also, we're not actually going to rule on that first part. And so if this happens again, there's no precedent again for this. And that is what qualified immunity is. When there is an unconstitutional act, we say, unless that there is an identical case in your jurisdiction, you are not gonna be able to recover. And so obviously this has huge ramifications, particularly in policing, where we do see unconstitutional violations occur, and then there's no accountability for those. And without accountability, you're not gonna see correction. And so there has been certain uh, changes to this law to say essentially, hey, you cannot do this where you say, I didn't know I was under um, you know, I, I didn't know this was clearly established when it's an actual constitutional violation. And so this is really the problem here. We saw another case in, in, in Texas recently where someone uh, called police because their, their son was having a critical meltdown, um, was having a mental health issue, doused himself in gasoline. The officers knew he had gasoline on him and they were about to tase him. One cop says, if you tase him, he will catch on fire. The cop tased him and he caught on fire. The house caught on fire. The Fifth Circuit said that was qualified immunity protects the court, uh, the, uh, the officer. At the Supreme Court level, they actually overturned this for the first time, even going, although it wasn't clearly established, any officer um, you know, should know that, you know, 
stuff like that. So that's what we're hoping for in these cases. But that's the real problem. The examples really show some of the lunacy with this because the you know the language sounds nice. It's clearly established. It's it's good faith. It's it's all these things. But when in practice you see what this actually turns into, it's a lack of accountability for all government officials. This doesn't mean just law enforcement. This is freedom of speech uh, at First Amendment. Uh, issues at college campuses, if you're depriving someone from speaking on there. A lot of the cases come out of there. AFP has done a lot of work in the First Amendment area on qualified immunity. It protects all government officials from accountability. And until that changes, you're going to see these egregious examples continue over and over again. Thanks, Greg. Another question. How do you see qualified immunity as it relates to any police reform package moving forward? That's a great question. So we saw the House package, the Justice and Policing Act, uh, just passed through very recently. It had um, a bill that was introduced last session, and then this session, uh, it was uh, Justin Amash uh, and Ayanna Presley, and then it was Ayanna Presley this session, um, that essentially just says clear as day, qualified immunity no longer can be a defense in these claims. It was very broad and basic. Now, there has been some controversy about what that language should look like. Should there be other, um, you know, potential, uh, you know, qualifiers in there, or protections for individual officers. There was a bill uh, presented by Senator Mike Braun uh, last session as well that had a little bit more uh, protections for law enforcement uh, in there if they were potentially going to be on the hook financially at the end because of their actions. Um, and so really, you know, who knows what's going to be, you know, the horse trading involved with, um, you know, congressional action on police reform if it's a large package, but we would like to see qualified immunity be a part of any package that comes through the House and Senate. Uh, what that looks like at the end, um, and if there's compromise to be had based upon what the House has just passed, um, that's, a, that's a distinct possibility. But I, I do think uh, based upon what we're hearing and what we've been seeing, uh, and, and Mike, you know, as, as our government affairs head here, obviously, you know as well, that qualified immunity is an incredibly important issue um, on both in both chambers right now uh, for Republicans and Democrats alike. And so finding that that compromise, I think, is going to be critical uh, for any practice, um, you know, package to come through. And another thing we have to kind of discuss here, you know, most of almost all policing is at the state and local level. And so the federal government only has, you know, just so much to do with that. And this is the one area that is wholly a federal issue that impacts state and local policing. And so I think this is a really critical area where the federal government can act and do something about accountability and policing where we may not want to see other things uh, that they're doing in, in policing potentially uh, to put too much rigidness on state and local actors. So you're not having the same type of policing, uh, for example, in Houston as you're having in West Texas. I mean, policing is so different from an inner city into a rural area or suburban area. There's things that we want standardized, but um, you need to be very careful. The qualified immunity is one thing that we should have across the board. If any officer or any government official violates your constitutional rights, they should be held accountable. Um, that may not mean them personally financially, that may mean the local government or the law enforcement agency, but there should be an accountability factor there or else we're not going to see uh, the types of actions that we find egregious change. Don't forget that if you'd like to ask Greg or Jeremiah a question, please type it in the chat and we'll try to answer your question live and on the air. Now, Greg, going back to the first step that, that was mentioned earlier, in the wake of the passage of that monumental bill, why is police reform important? And can you give our audience an overview of AFP's viewpoint? Yeah, um, and so I'll give kind of a little personal account um, to me. So my dad was a cop. He was also, uh, he's currently a Secret Service agent. He now trains cadets uh, in, in his older times uh, up in Beltsville, Maryland now. Um, and so I've been around police my entire life. Um, you know, I, I've trusted them um, wholeheartedly. You know, my, my dad's buddies were all all cops. Many of them will be uh, at my uh, wedding coming up. You know, I've always had a good relationship police officer. I can't tell you one time I've had um, a, uh, a, a potentially bad encounter with officers. And we know that not everyone has that same experience that I have had growing up. Um, and so that, that, that really matters. And so I think police really do play such a critical role in our society every day, they're tasked with keeping our community safe, which routinely places them in harm's way. And we have great respect for the, the work that law enforcement do, does. Effectively maintaining public safety and order begins with policing practices that build community trust and collaboration. The biggest tool in a cop's toolbox is trust from the community and getting inside information and details about what happened and occurred. Obviously, we have many cameras now, there's DNA, there's a lot of other things, but eyewitness accounts on what happened in certain communities is as important as anything uh, to actually solving a case. 
But we've seen so many encounters now throughout the years um, between officers in the community that have uh, ended in tragedy uh, and that build distrust and erode trust between uh, the community and police at large. Some of these are single shot things where you have bad actors that come through and, and do something that really erodes that trust. But a lot of these are also external factors and things that happen to line officers that puts them in potentially bad places. We'll get into financial incentives. Jeremiah talked earlier about fines and fees and uh, driver's license suspensions. Cops are asked to do a lot of non-core police functions, um, civil asset forfeiture, collecting fines and fees, traffic citations, pulling people over and arresting them for unpaid warrants from, from back in the day, uh, going into mental health crises without necessary training and proper training or alongside of social workers. So we're asking police to do so, so much. And the things that we're asking them to do are not these core functions of public safety and community collaboration. And so it's not working for either. It's not working for the community and it's not working for police. And we really need to transform culture and remove barriers to good policing and let police do the tasks that they're able to do. And that's going to require a systemic change of policing, not only for the benefit of the community, but also um, for the benefit of, of law enforcement to be able to clear cases. If you look at case solving and clearance rates, so essentially a clearance rate means we have found a suspect and we have arrested a suspect. They've essentially stayed static or dropped since the 1960s and 70s. Now think about how much technological uh, improvements we have in society, security cameras, DNA, all these different things, you know, we have better intelligence on what, you know, to look for in a suspect. Um, you know, if you've seen Mindhunter, those types of things. And it continues to stay static. And that tells you that we're probably focusing on the wrong things or we're not getting the right information for the community to help solve cases. And until we build that community trust and that collaboration again, we're going to continue to see bad outcomes. We're going to see cases go unsolved and we're going to continue to see a perpetuation of things that have happened, like the George Floyd instance or other instances that happen, or just this innocuous, you know, pull over at the side of the road um, that ends in a bad encounter, or just a harassment, or the story from a father to their son, or a mother to their daughter. These types of stories that go down in generations that, hey, maybe you don't always trust the police, or hey, if a cop comes knocking at your door, maybe we're not going to um, tell them all the information because we've had this story in our past, and that really impacts generations. So until we start transforming police culture, we're never going to get past that point. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that we can see, this opportunity where everyone is focused on this issue to look at this, come to a bipartisan head like we did with the First Step Act, and really transform police at the federal, state, and local level, um, we really should strike on this opportunity um, in this current time. Thanks, Greg. Criminal justice reform is an issue that many can put partisan Washington politics aside for and coalesce around. We saw that with the First Step Act. When success looked bleak, AFP and others on and off the Hill came together to make the impossible possible. Uh, there were many reforms untouched by the First Step Act that potentially could have a very positive impact for millions. Paint for us the picture of a practical second step or next step and tell us why those reforms are still needed. No, certainly, it's a great question, Mike. And, and so I'll, I'll kind of go on, on two things. I think policing is its own section. We can kind of get in a few of the things that America's Prosperity would like to see in a policing uh, reform package. We also sent a letter with a very bipartisan uh, coalition. I'll name a couple of the groups there. Um, ALEC Action, uh, America's Tax Reform, Freedom Works, Just an Action Network, Law Enforcement Action uh, Partnership. Uh, the Police and Project New York University, NACDL, the Criminal Defense uh, Lawyers Association, all looking at these types of things within policing packages that they would like to see. One, looking at accountability. And so at the federal and state level, looking at requiring employment records to be considered uh, if a law enforcement officer is moving from one jurisdiction to another. A lot of the times what we see is that an officer will have a misconduct happen, they will resign, or quit or be suspended and then just go to another law enforcement agency and just kind of keep bopping around um, without the, the prospective law enforcement agency knowing about their past, so requiring those records to be considered. Um, and then also creating standardized practice at the federal level for decertification. There really isn't standardized practice on what should a cop be decertified for or not. And there are so many different law enforcement agencies um, at the federal level, park police, FBI, uh, DOD, a lot of them carrying guns and weapons and have the opportunity to potentially use lethal force. We need to have 
actions that potentially do decertify these and have them at a standardized level. Looking at transparency on use of force actions. Um, there is a, a FBI use of force registry. It's voluntary right now. We should make that required for state, local, and federal officials to report so we have a full picture of what use of force looks like across the country. Um, looking at decertification and misconduct records, if there's founded allegations, there should be a local and hubbed registry at the federal level for state, local, and federal law enforcement officials if there's found in misconduct allegations. There are ones that are third party and they're voluntary and they get some great data, but we should really start making this holistic and across the board. Um, looking at policies on training and limiting the use of force. So I know we've looked at banning chokeholds has been a part of packages. So AFP would like to see a ban on chokeholds unless deadly force is also, also authorized. After speaking with a lot of law enforcement officials, having that provision that if deadly force is utilized, it actually could potentially prevent a deadly encounter by allowing that in those situations. Um, limiting the use of no-knock warrants in specific situations where an individual potentially could be a risk rather than, hey, this person committed a crime, everyone's a risk, we should be able to use a no-knock warrant. We saw the uh, tragic encounter in Brianna Taylor and the mishaps that happened there to prevent those types of things at the federal, state, uh, and local level. Having clear policy and guidelines and those are open to the public, just knowing how, what do you do in a de-escalation situation? What type of force do you use in these types of processes? And having that clear and transparent to the public is gonna be absolutely critical. And then you look at things like qualified immunity, like we talked about, and then civil asset forfeiture. We talked about core government functions, civil asset forfeiture, the process by which a law enforcement official and the prosecuting office can seize and forfeit your property without ever charging you or arresting you with a crime. This causes severe friction in, in particularly in inner city and minority communities where this happens much more often. And so putting limitations on that um, or just completely eliminating it and say, hey, you have to be convicted of a crime before we can actually do this and go forth. Many, many states have gone through this process now. It's time for the feds to do the same. And then looking at kind of the more holistic second step that would come from the First Step Act, looking at marijuana descheduling right now. We've obviously seen some, some provisions in the Moore Act and others uh, that would actually deschedule marijuana and marijuana, make it a state, uh, state progress. Now, there's certain regulatory things within these bills that um, you know, we'd like to see so we don't kind of do the same missteps as other uh, practices that have gone from illegal to legal and make sure that particularly, you know, budding enterprises in minority communities, people that have actually been plagued by the criminal justice system are able to enter into these systems as well as small business owners is incredibly critical. And so we're going to be looking at that and advocating for a very free market approach uh, to these. Looking at pretrial form, there's presumptions on um, marijuana, uh, drug offenses that you should be held pretrial. Those things should, should change. You need to have a more successful pretrial system at the federal level. Um, expansion of early release and potentially the reinstatement of parole. A at the federal level, for most crimes, you have to spend 85% of your time uh, in prison. The First Step Act changed that a bit for some people, but we should expand parole and give opportunities for people to succeed and reenter society successfully and give them those tools while they're in prison. And then looking at sentencing reform, we have so many different offenses that still carry mandatory minimums for low level crimes. It should be for the judge, the prosecutor, defense counsel, um, and the potential of the jury to look at crimes and say, what is the individualized sentence that makes sense for this individual rather than what Congress has said 10 years for everything, for example, for certain drug offenses. So those are a little bit of things. There's a long way to go. That first step was terrific. It was much needed reform, but there's a lot more that we can do at the federal level uh, to really advance our criminal justice system. I'd like to ask one more question, Greg, before we move to audience audiences questions. Uh, AFP strives every day to create a society of mutual benefit. That drives our many policy positions, including our focus on criminal justice reform. Can you talk a little bit about how our work on criminal justice reform helps us get closer to achieving that goal of a society of mutual benefit? And why is a concentration on a guiding principle like that important to an organization like AFP and the mission at hand? No, certainly, Mike. Um, you know, one thing that we say around here all the time is that we believe every person has unique gifts that enable them to realize their American dream. And I truly believe that I know our foundation truly believes that. And so really at the core of what we do is breaking these barriers that are unnecessary to allow every individual to achieve their American dream. And I think the criminal justice system is one of the best examples of the government creating unnecessary barriers that limit people's potential and limits them from experiencing the American dream. And so it is incredibly critical that we're looking at a criminal justice system that it's just, it's proper, it prioritizes public safety, but it also allows people to advance and move on. It's a, it's a reform system. It's supposed to reform individuals. They did a mistake. There was a wrong committed. Why was that wrong committed? Let's fix that wrong and move forward. And for countless years, 
our decision on how to correct that wrong has been lengthy periods of incarceration for almost all offenses, regardless of if they are a public safety concern, a drug use concern, um, a potentially a mental illness concern. It has all been the one size fits all. And we've seen how much of an utter failure that has been and how many generations have been limited and deprived of the American dream because of our criminal justice system at the federal, state, and local level. And so to create a society of mutual benefit, it is in imperative that we actually fix our criminal justice system, because without fixing our criminal justice system, we will never achieve that society of mutual benefit. Well, thanks so much, Greg and Mike. Um, as usual, extremely comprehensive and informative on a host of issues within policing reform. Um, now, we would love to move to the Q&A portion. So we have a few questions that have come through the chat again. If you have a pressing question now, feel free to put it in and we will uh, likely be able to get to it. So the first one, and Jeremiah and Greg, feel free to figure out who wants to take <laughs> each of these. But um, the first one I think is for you, Greg. It is related to qualified immunity. So the question is, are the two questions of qualified immunity always asked in order? Or is the second question clearly established, sometimes asked first? If so, what effect does this cause? And also, does qualified immunity apply to all government employees? And if so, should we eliminate it for all of them? Uh, great, great questions there. And, and actually, you used to have to ask both questions. You used to have to ask if it was a constitutional violation, and then you have to ask if it was clearly established. That changed. And so you actually get to go to question two. Uh, before you go to question one now. And so the ramifications of that is you never actually create precedent for what is uh, constitutional or unconstitutional. So a good example, like we talked about in those cases, uh, let's, let's go with the, the Jessup case where there was a, a theft of, of money there. The court never actually determined whether it was unconstitutional or not within their, it was just dicta. There was no ruling on that. So they just said, it's not clearly established, let's move forward. So if this does happen again, the same um, uh, uh, end result will occur. And so you never actually create precedent because of what the Supreme Court has said. That wasn't always the case. Very recently, the Supreme Court has said, you do not have to answer question one before you have to answer question two. And so you never establish a precedent. The whole point of this was, at the very least, we would at least start establishing precedent and create a you know case laws on what is constitutional, what is not constitutional. Now that is no longer necessary. And obviously that has huge ramifications on accountability measures here and really undercuts really the last bastion of accountability that we had within our qualified immunity uh, spectrum. So that's, that's, a, that's a great question. And that's a huge, huge concern here. Uh, to answer the second question, it does uh, go across the board for all government employees. And so I know a lot of the talk has been on law enforcement, uh, but I don't think it should be just limited to law enforcement. I think it should be expanded to all government employees. Like we talked about before, AFP has been a, a huge proponent uh, and, and active in our, in our legal actions on um, First Amendment speaking rights at college campuses when someone's denied uh, to speak somewhere because of their beliefs or, or what have you without any you know, public safety risk or whatever else it is. Um, and that's been a major, major concern. And so we see that. I used to be a divorce attorney in Maryland, uh, Child Protective Services. There is a egregious violations of constitutional rights that happen um, in, in the Child Protective Service Agency. Um, and they are limited on their accountability. You know? So I think that there is uh, certain things that we should do here. Now, um, one thing we get asked quite a bit is about legislative and judicial immunities and things like that. Those are wholly different uh, than those. That's a discussion for another day, but these would not fall into those. There's other immunities beyond qualified immunity, absolute immunities for judges, what they're doing within when they're on the bench, prosecutors and what have you. But that's a different story for a different day. But all other government employees, absolutely, they do fall under this. And I think that should change. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is on expungement. And the question is, do we need to expand expungement of federal crimes? Yeah, Melinda, I, I won't go too far in detail about the problems here, but just want to briefly say the problem here is when someone has a criminal record, they face almost 44,000 legal barriers plus societal stigma that really holds them back from getting a job, securing education, finding a place to live. We know from a recent study that average annual earnings go down by 52% if you have any form of criminal record. 
So having a criminal record is a very serious thing. And so expungement is something that has been discussed largely on the state level so far as a solution to that problem. It's a function that allows people to remove that criminal record from public eye. So it can still be accessed by courts, by prosecutors, by law enforcement in some instances, but it just removes kind of those societal barriers that are holding them back from achieving their potential. Sometimes they have to prove that they've been rehabilitated. Other times it's automatic. Uh, I know at AFP, we would love to see automatic for arrest and other types of non-conviction records. If you've not been convicted guilty, you should not have to deal with the barriers of having a criminal record. But the problem is, is the federal system actually has the most limited expungement mechanism in the country. It only applies to individuals who were convicted of certain low-level drug crimes while they were under the age of 21. That's the only people that can qualify in the federal system. And this is a petition-based system. They have to go in front of the courts and be approved. So what we would love to see is that mechanism broadened. Uh, we're not saying apply it to everyone with every single crime, but we do believe there are more people that have really proven that they've been rehabilitated, that should be able to move on from the barriers that come along with a criminal record. And actually, uh, just last week, uh, Representative Jeffries and some other members of the House introduced the Begin Again Act. And this is a small step in the right direction. All that bill does is essentially remove the 21-year cap. So anyone convicted of any low-level drug offense can now go in front of the court and have that opportunity to have their criminal record expunged. That's fantastic. And I appreciate you highlighting, you know, the importance of the reintegration part of reform. I mean, no matter what happens, you know, within the prison system, it's very clear that if people can't reintegrate successfully into society, that's what causes the recidivism rate to go so high because then they end up right back in the system. So really appreciate um, any efforts from congressional leaders on the expungement front. Uh, the next question <clears throat> relates to an aspect of police reform that we haven't yet talked about today, and that's the 1033 program. Uh, so the question is, where does Americans for Prosperity stand on the 1033 program? Jeremiah, I'm happy to kick it off and, and we, can, we can go back and forth here. So. For those that don't know, the 1033 program is essentially a, a program where the Department of Defense can give surplus military material to local and state law enforcement officials. So, you know, particularly after the Iraq war in Afghanistan, we start remove, pulling troops or things aren't necessary anymore, outdated or just not wanted by the federal government. They're actually able to bring that down to the local and state level. The vast majority of the, uh, the equipment is office administrative stuff, literally chairs, desks, um, you know, those old like, you know, uh, things that used to have the take like geometry class out if there wasn't enough uh, space at your high school, like those annexes, like those types of things are a lot of the material. But a lot of the material also is weaponry, um, you know, mine resistance uh, uh, tanks, uh, you know, uh, smoke uh, grenades, all these things. And the government's able to give that to local and state government with very little transparency, very, very little accountability and pretty much non-existent training requirements on how to utilize this. The, the thing that really brought this to light was in Ferguson, Missouri, as you saw a local law enforcement department come out in camouflage and Kevlar and had tear gas and rocket launcher grenades to shoot that tear gas and all these things. And you're saying, how does a town of this small magnitude have all this stuff? Well, it's a 1033 program. Now, I think there is some merit to have small, you know, guns and things like that go to local law enforcement jurisdictions that are underfunded potentially. But we really need to be mindful and careful about what we're giving to individuals when they do not have the training. The public doesn't have transparency on what that is. And there's no accountability for misuse or inappropriate use of that materials. And so uh, during the Obama administration, there was limitations put on what what could be there. You also had to do higher um, requirements on what was the actual specific need. We'd like to see things implemented like that again, um, potentially greater restrictions on what type of munitions can go down or at least a heightened requirement on explaining uh, what that is and what that looks like. Um, and, and like we said, transparency, accountability on these things and critically proper training. We do not want law enforcement officials or any officials having these types of weapons without uh, necessary training. There was actually law that says that if you don't use it, you will lose it. And so, you, you know, that, that's a really big problem because when you, when you want to hold on to something, you know, every, you know, you're a hammer and everything turns into a nail. You're going to use this stuff. And I, Arthur Reiser, who's a 
former police officer that we work with quite a bit, um, he always talks about this. He's like, I was a cop. If we got new material and equipment, I was going to use it. I'm like a little kid. And so it's probably what happens to a lot of people. They, they utilize this stuff unnecessarily in those situations because you do have it and you're actually required to use in those situations. So we really need to look at it, just like with the police we were talking about before, accountability, transparency, and training are so critical with things that are going down. And you know, the University of Texas doesn't need an AMRAC to be stored there. Um, they, ju they just don't. Uh, and so uh, we need to be really, really concerned about those types of things. Yeah, and Greg, I think just one additional point is since Ferguson, we've had a lot of academics engage in research to understand what is the impact of this equipment being given to agencies. And so far, the research writ large says this is not actually improving public safety. Agencies that receive this equipment do not see violent crime, property crime, drug crime go down in their communities. But we also on the flip side see that agencies that are receiving this equipment it actually increases use of force and lethal incidents between law enforcement and their communities. So we're not actually achieving the goal that we want to achieve here. And we're actually harming more people by allowing this equipment to be unnecessarily used. Yeah, and that gets to back say. to that trust part. Oh, I'm sorry, Mary, I was just gonna say, and it gets no. back to that community trust part. You see an officer in either plain clothes or a polo or um, just their general uniform, that's one thing. When you, I, I live in D.C. I know looking at the National Guard and federal agents constantly at every checkpoint with huge guns, huge strapped up to the T, it changes the dynamic of that. And when you're in the inner city, potentially had bad experience with officers before, those are the types of things that visual impact is so critical um, and really breaks down that community trust. Thank you. That was a really, really helpful. Um, next question from the audience has to do with precedent and maybe you can talk a little bit too about in general the interaction between state and federal um, law on a few of these things but this question specifically to chokeholds and no knock warrants and the question is are there any precedents of limiting chokeholds and limiting no knock warrants in states around the country yeah, I, I can discuss a few here. And so in, in the recent time, starting in uh, the summer 2020, leading up into this legislative session, a lot of states have actually done uh, some police reforms along that line. So uh, with no knock warrants, uh, we saw a bill SB 5030 in Virginia, uh, limited no knock warrants. Uh, the final language uh, became a little grainy uh, during kind of the horse trading aspects, um, but it would limit the, the use of no knock warrants in certain situations. Also, what time of day you're able to execute them and why you're able to execute them. They also prohibited the use of chokeholds unless um, it was uh, necessary to protect law enforcement uh, officer or another person from death or serious injury. Uh, HF1 in Minnesota was a very omnibus bill package that did very similar measures to there on chokeholds, um, but did not uh, touch uh, no knock warrants. We saw a bill. I'm not sure if it's going to get across the finish line in Kentucky. I believe it's HB4, if I'm not mistaken, Jeremiah, that would have done a lot of limitations on no-knock warrants. They may not act during this, but there's going to go into a potential uh, next session or during this year and potentially act on that. Uh, New Hampshire also did something very similar on banning chokeholds and let the use of lethal fourth is authorized, um, and that is HB1645. Uh, Illinois just had an ominous policing package uh, go through, and I believe that banned chokeholds and did limits and no-knock warrants. We weren't as involved uh, in that package legislation. I want to say it was SB 1753, but if you just look up Illinois policing package, uh, you'll definitely be able to find it. Uh, those are the biggies that I know of now. I know a couple are still matriculating through the 2021 session, but those are the ones that passed during 2020. Yeah, and I think it's worth adding that before 2020, at least I'm not aware of any state that had a state-level ban on chokeholds. When it comes to no-knock warrants, only Oregon and Florida had any form of ban on no-knock warrants in place. And some of the movement we have seen on no-knock warrants and these things have been city-based too. So places like Louisville, Memphis, Houston, Indianapolis have also adopted kind of city-wide policies. So even though there may not be a lot of movement on a lot of states, there's also municipalities that are doing things as well. And on that note, uh, Jeremiah or, or Greg, because I know you're very heavily involved in um, AFP's work in state policy as well. Can you just talk for a minute about a few resources we might be able to offer on the state level when it comes to information? For example, if someone's office is considering involvement in a federal um, piece of legislation, they usually want to know what's happening on the state level as well. Is there a good resource for them on that level? 
Well, I, I think, you know, I'll, I'll you, I, I think we're a very good resource on this. You know, we have chapters in 35 states and we're, we're tracking uh, all of these. I'm actually putting together kind of a 2020-2021 uh, rundown of everything that passed and, and failed that we were advocating on. Hopefully that we can make that uh, for, for public use. So be on the lookout for that. But I'd be happy if you coming from any other state or interested in an issue or topic, please reach out to myself and Jeremiah. I'm sure one of us has reviewed a bill somewhere uh, on that. So we definitely have that, that model language or at least language that gets to that point. And we can kind of talk through potentially some of the shortfalls or improvements that could come uh, uh, from that. Particularly in qualified immunity, we just saw a couple states, New Mexico, uh, just recently passed uh, HB4, and now it's on the governor's desk. Uh, in New Hampshire, uh, a bill just passed, there's uh, gonna be heard by the full house and then go to the Senate. Uh, very recently. So that's kind of moving through. And Virginia actually had a pretty good bill uh, that did not make it during their regular session on that. Um, NCSL um, also uh, tracks a lot of the policing uh, reforms that are going across the country. They're always a, a terrific resource. I know Vera has had um, some, some documents and resources as well. Um, those are the biggies that I have been kind of looking at, but please, I'm, I'm open to anything. So please feel free to reach out to me. Fabulous. So we have a few more minutes before we hit the hour. So uh, one other question I see, um, and this is related to a piece of legislation we haven't yet, dis yet discussed. Question is, where does the Safe Banking Act stand in American for, Pros American for Prosperity's priorities for criminal justice reform? Yeah, I'll jump in here first and Greg, feel free to jump in after I'm done. Uh, I think one thing that we've really been doing a lot of thinking around and researching and trying to find ways to engage is on the issue of substance use and substance use disorders. Uh, the reality is our country is not doing a good job. As Greg mentioned, we have a one size fits all solution to these problems and we're throwing people in jail and in prison for use of substances. That's not working. We're not seeing drug use go down. We're not seeing overdoses go down. So we need to rethink how we're dealing with these problems. And some states have started to do that when it comes to marijuana. They've tried to open up markets, regulate them, provide a safe way for people to use these substances rather than forcing themselves into the black market. But the problem is, is that on the federal level, it's, it's still technically illegal. It's still a scheduled substance on the federal level. And so what that actually is doing, even in those states that have legalized, it is perpetuating the black market because legitimate businesses, legitimate banks are not willing to engage in this industry because the federal government has only given implicit agreement to the states that have done this. And so the Safe Banking Act would actually help free up the financial structure, ensure that people do not have to have armed guards and, and armored trucks to take their tax money and cash to the state capital to pay the state revenue board. So really allowing all types of financial institutions, allowing states to really continue to innovate in this area and find solutions so we can move people to actual health and long-term potential is what we really need to do. And this is kind of a first step in getting there. No, that, that was great, uh, Jeremiah. You know, you just don't think about those things like the plumber coming over to fix pipes at, at a marijuana place or, you know, the lighting guy or, or anything else. Like all these people are potentially liable uh, for assisting in a, in a criminal enterprise um, based upon the letter of the law. So it's very critical to have these safe harbors for sure. Well, thank you both so much, Greg and Jeremiah. Mike, always great working with you. Thank you, everybody who uh, signed on and uh, to this briefing. We really appreciate your time and consideration. We hope this was helpful. And again, if you have any questions about anything we discussed here or anything else um, regarding criminal justice reform, please do feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, at any point, we would love to be helpful. And uh, again, just really appreciate your time and hope you all have a fantastic weekend. Thanks so much.